Hi, and welcome to Allen High School. We are talking right now about phase changes and the relationship of bonding and intermolecular forces to those phase transitions. Now, um, we saw a heating cooling curve, and I came up with this own little one because it the last one, the typical ones you see show only four of the six phase changes. Uh, transitions and you need to see all six of them you need to memorize all of them so I made up another one this is a situation in which we are first off heating a solid so let's say it's dry ice we could be heating dry ice you notice that it has a fixed volume and fixed shape and because we are heating it it is and there is an increase in temperature we have a change in kinetic energy and now, once we reached the point of sublimation, where we would be going from a solid ultimately to a gas, so right here there's both solid and gas present, and during that point you notice there's no change in temperature. So there is no temperature change during a phase change. That's because the energy issues being addressed are ones of potential energy. So they are either, uh, attractive forces are either being broken if it's a heating curve or they're being formed if it's a cooling curve. Either way, it's a change in potential energy. So do you notice during the phase transition, you have both phases present. Now, once it has all been converted to gas, then the kinetic energy can start to rise. And when the kinetic energy increases, you see an increase in temperature. So this is gas. So we have solid, we have heating a solid alone. During the phase transition, we'll see both solid and gas, and then we can heat the gas alone. Now, most of you are familiar with sublimation. Uh, hopefully you remember from pre-AP. If not, here's your reminder that the opposite of sublimation, gas going back to solid directly, is called deposition. Now, I said we were going to calculate this later on, but I do want to introduce the terms. You all know what enthalpy is. You know about exothermic and endothermic. Those aren't new terms for you. So I want to talk about enthalpy of fusion and enthalpy of vaporization because what we want to be able to do is compare the amounts of energy based on bonding and intermolecular forces. So we're still discussing things on a conceptual level, which means you really have to study your notes quite well. All right, so delta H of fusion is the energy, remember, it takes to break uh, forces in order to melt. Or it's the energy that is freed to form attractions. So um, when it is melting, this would be a positive value. When it is freezing, it would be a negative value. It's always reported as a positive value. You have to infuse that extra bit of meaning uh, into the number to tell us whether it is an uh, endothermic process, melting is an endo versus an exo. Now the enthalpy, I notice I have a typo here when I cut and pasted. This is the enthalpy of vaporization. Make sure you fix your notes there. Delta H of vaporization. This is the energy it takes to break forces of attraction to vaporize so in this case it would be positive or that is freed to form attractions when it condenses in which case it would be negative now um, 
I, I don't think I have this in the notes anywhere, so I think this might be a time to do a quick reminder here. If we have a liquid going to a gas, if it is at the boiling point, it is called vaporization. If we have liquid going to a gas below the boiling point, it's called evaporation. We will focus on vaporization, but the principles of intermolecular forces that hold true in comparing uh, vaporization hold true with evaporation as well. So we want to keep that in mind. All right. Now, what are we breaking? What are we forming? So what forces are broken? This would be during uh, the melting or the vaporizing, and believe it or not, you can vaporize a metal, not in any laboratory conditions we'll be looking at, but you can. Now, I thought this picture might be a good complement to a table that I have made for you, and we'll see that in a couple of minutes. But let's take a look now at what we're talking about breaking when we melt or vaporize. If it's a network covalent, you're actually breaking, in order to melt or vaporize it, you're, you're actually breaking covalent bonds. The energy is anywhere, you know, this is a broad range, 300 to 1,000 kilojoules per mole. And that's why these have such high melting temperatures. Okay? When we have metallic, when we're melting or vaporizing it, you're actually breaking these attractive forces that form between the delocalized electrons. So it's something of a, remember we said it's something of a covalent bond? It's shared delocalized electrons. Covalent, they're localized by and large in um, network covalent. Graphite would be an exception, but by and large, they're localized. Here, these are delocalized electrons attracted to the positive, and that metallic bond is being broken. We're talking of a range of 50 to 1,000, and solids, uh, metals, can melt anywhere from 60 to over 3,000 degrees. Okay? And ionic, you're breaking those electrostatic, those plus minus electrostatic attractions and that takes a lot of energy that's pure positive pure elect uh, negative pure coulombs heavy coulombs of energy the energy required to break that is you know a thousand kilojoules per mole and melting points can be over 3,000 and you know less than that but very very high uh, by and large you're not going to have to compare these. Um, I do want to note that I have referenced all of my pictures here. Um, hopefully that's going to be okay with the people that I find them on the, on the web. So I'm not selling these folks. All right. Uh, these are all going to have very high delta H of fusion because we're talking about melting in particular. Uh, certainly the same relative uh, magnitudes would be the same if we were talking about vaporizing okay i'm not going to look at comparing these on a regular basis like if you said well metallic's always higher than ionic ionic's higher than network covalent i think you can see from the numbers we can't make those generalizations i would need to see firm numbers before i would make any conclusions in comparing these but here is a key comparison these are all very much higher than your intermolecular forces that we have with our molecular covalence. Here, I would be breaking a hydrogen bond. FYI, you should be able to draw these. All, all these pictures that I am showing you here, you should find a way. You don't have to be an artist, but you do have to uh, have a way to draw this. I, there was an AP question just like this, show hydrogen bonding just like this. So that would be a hydrogen bond that's a dipole dipole and this this is pure iodine this is that temporary so this is a London dispersion force and do you notice we're talking about many orders of magnitude less okay 
anywhere from 10 to 100 times different in energy of those forces of attraction compared to the bonds that we see in the others. So here we're only, I say only, we're only breaking intermolecular forces. They are much weaker. So IMFs are going to be much weaker than the bonding that we see in these other substances. And I really wanted um, to make that point. All right. Now, um, very quickly, I want to make one other point about ionics here. And before I move on to the next topics, with metals, there's not really any truly firm trends. Uh, some people like to talk about trends in a few of the, them. If you go down a group, the melting point increases, but that doesn't seem to hold true. And so I, I, I looked at quite a few before I uh, went out on limb here to say that there's really not any firm trends. And I'm hoping AP is not asking you to memorize trends that don't really exist for many group. But there is a few generalizations. With transition metals, as the number of non-bonded or unpaired electrons, really I should, I wanted to say unpaired would have been better, unpaired electrons increases, the repulsion generally decreases, right? Remember paired electrons have more repulsion. So if they're unpaired, there's less repulsion and the melting point generally increases. And so I should not have said non-bonded there. Please cross that off. That is an incorrect statement. Um, so if we were to do an orbital diagram, a situation like this would tend to have a low, or excuse me, higher melting point than a situation in which they were paired because pairing causes repulsion. Repulsions would cause a, uh, a lower melting point. Okay, uh, I'm going to talk about this ionic in the next video. So until then, this is signing off. <laughs>